All right, I wanted to welcome everyone to the January 2024 edition of the Agile Austin Agile at Scale Meetup. This is our first one of the year. We took a little break in December, so really happy to be back with you all today and got a great topic. But before we get to that, just a little bit about Agile Austin, if this is your first time joining. Uh, our mission, we love to connect people and foster professional growth uh, through collaborative events and really is all about that learning. Um, our board members, our terms are coming up here. There will be elections in a couple of months. We're going to have a couple of vacancies on the board. So Scott Killen, the founder of Agile Austin, uh, will be um, retiring from, he's already retired from his corporate career, but will be retiring from the board as well. So uh, we thank him for his service, dedication, and also uh, growing this amazing community over the many different years. And so um, if you have an interest mm -hmm. in chief financial officering, um, definitely reach out to board at agileaustin.org. We'd love to have you join. Um, and we'll probably have at least one more vacancy as well. Um, and we also would love to see some competitive elections uh, and not just have everyone run up unopposed. So feel free to uh, email us board at agileaustin.org. If you're interested, I wanted to thank our sponsors of Agile Austin overall, our platinum sponsor, uh, Agile Velocity, who has supported us as an organization for many years and makes so many of these uh, free events possible for um, the larger Agile community out in the world. We also have our silver sponsor, Ad Meliora Coaching, um, and I'll have some links towards the end of our presentation for both of those sponsors. Um, and I also wanted to uh, say that Agile Velocity has um, a discount available for anyone that wants to take uh, make use of their services. Uh, there's a code Agile Austin uh, for 15% off of their workshops. I'll sh share this presentation afterwards with that uh, offer. So don't have to, and the recording will be up on YouTube as well. So you don't have to uh, whip out your smartphone just uh, right now. It'll be available afterwards. So if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, we are always interested in that. Uh, you can go to our website. There's a section on that uh, about some of the benefits you get as a sponsor. And you can always contact us as well. Um, and our membership fee has stayed the same for many years now. Uh, no inflation on that price. We have been $35 uh, for at least a decade plus at this point. So um, we have a Slack community that you can join. And uh, then there are also additional opportunities for other events and training discounts that we have throughout the year. So um, you can, again, go to agileaustin.org to sign up if you're interested. Uh, we have other meetups happening. Um, so our Agile Coaching SIG, this one, the Agile at Scale, our book club continues to thrive. Uh, Leader SIG, which is also run by Max, our president, uh, Lean Kanban, Scrum Master, a lot of good stuff. And we're also looking for a co-lead for the product SIG, which we'd like to kick off again. We've got one volunteer and just need one more person. So um, again, you can go to our site and uh, visit the forum for potentially volunteering. Uh, and then the big thing coming up for us in terms of in-person meetups, we do have one that's uh, on February 20th, which is kind of a smaller, uh, probably be a smaller gathering, but then we've got our larger conference, which is coming up on March 7th, um, which it, it, the topic will, um, and the theme of the conference will be Agile Growth Mindset, many presentations around that. Um, if you, we also have a really great session in store for kind of navigating where the tech industry right now is with all of the layoffs and such. So uh, you can go to our site. I'll have a link here shortly for tickets as well as um, we have um now a second growth sponsor, IC Agility, in addition to Evolve Agility. So I'll have a link for them, uh, as well as our thanks to Improving and um, 
evolve. So uh, I will say that tickets are available in person, but we will also have a virtual um, option as well, which um, is a very reasonable and affordable price. So check that out if you don't think you can make it to the actual conference. Um, so on to this SIG, uh, Leland and I have been running this for quite some time now. He started in 2016 and I joined him in 2020. And uh, yeah, we have really enjoyed it and all the speakers that we bring in. So uh, looking ahead to that, um, we have in February, Quentin Cortel will be talking about fast agile or self-organization eats agile at scale. Um, and then March collaboration at scale with Joanna Rothman. And currently April of 2024 is open. So if uh, you are interested in speaking, um, our contact information will be at the end of this. So uh, for today's presentation, we've got Mark Ricks on uh, beaming in uh, to us from Hawaii, actually. So pretty cool location there. Um, he's going to be talking today about accelerating value flow in the age of AI. So one of the hot topics of our time. So um, yeah, and with that, uh, either leland.newsom at agileaustin.org or ben.rogers at agileaustin.org if you're interested in presenting or want to chat about anything. And so, um, yep, that's all I had in terms of presentation. So thank you for that. I'm going to stop sharing and pass it on over to Mark. Take it away, Mark. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ben. Hello, everyone. How are you? It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me in. Uh, this is a pleasure. I've been wanting to uh, catch up with which, with Agile Austin for a while, and Leland and I have been talking for months and months and months about coming in for a spot. So I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak and interact with you guys here. So uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody. Uh, what I have planned is uh, um, some information for me. I'd like to get some information from you. Let's keep it interactive and let's learn from each other. So um, I'm here to talk about accelerating value flow in the age of AI. Um, it's definitely a hot topic for me and my team at Scaled Agile and Scaled Agile in general and our customers globally. So I wanted to take the opportunity to uh, uh, to talk a little bit about what we're doing with, with AI, my own perspectives, our company perspectives, and uh, some of the perspectives and learnings that I've gained through my personal interactions and travels um, over the last several months. So let's get into it. Um, it's great to see people from Austin here. I know that there are also people from all over the world. So this isn't just an Austin meetup. This is fantastic, representing a lot of different areas. So here we go. A little bit about me. I'm Mark Ricks. I'm what they call a safe fellow. Uh, which kind of means that um, I'm pretty useless in any other context. I know Scaled Agile really well. I know big enterprise transformations. I know Agile and Lean and DevOps and DevSecOps, all that kind of stuff. I write a lot and I, I pontificate, I proselytize, and um, I find myself in front of customers and events like this talking about how to do all of this uh, really nerdy stuff at scale. That's what I do, um, and I have a lot of fun doing it. I'm also a methodologist at, at Scaled Agile. I'm on the framework team. So we're the team that manages scaledagileframework.com. We have the big picture and all of the articles behind it. And uh, we manage the core knowledge base that drives our products and services around the rest of the company. Um, but if anybody was following me on social media over the past couple of weeks, I promoted this, uh, this meetup. And in that meetup, I promised to bring a big hat. Well, I don't have a big Texas style hat. so. I enlisted the help of AI, so I asked GP, ChatGPT to give me a hat, and this is what it did. Okay, so here's me. It's amazing how precise and 100% 100 accurate ChatGPT is these days, right? With the right prompts, it's, it's uncanny. So here's me with a big Texas style hat, but I didn't wanna show up all hat and no cattle. So I asked it to bring me some cattle too. So here's me, all hat, no cattle. Um, apparently to GPT, I'm some uh, fantasy Marlboro man guy. Um, 
okay, let's go with it. Maybe this will be my new uh, LinkedIn profile picture. Who knows? But that's a little bit about me. Let's talk about flow. So I wanted to take this in two parts. I wanted to talk about flow first and then how that relates to AI and how AI relates to flow in the second part. Um, so in order to create flow and to accelerate flow, we kind of need, need to understand what flow is and how it works. So before we get into depth on AI and how to accelerate value flow in the age of AI and using AI and leveraging AI, let's talk about flow so we can align on, align on the fundamentals. So here's a simple definition that comes from our framework. This is our view on flow and it's very consistent with lean definitions of flow. So very simply, Flow occurs when there's a smooth, linear, and fast movement of work product from step to step in a value stream. Pretty intuitive, right? Just wanted to get that out there. Flow means fast movement, smooth, linear, or laminar flow if you're a lean expert and would prefer that terminology path through the value stream. Okay, so what is a value stream? We want fast flow and we want to accelerate flow through the value stream, but what is a value stream? Well, it's kind of a simple concept too, but I wanted to ground us in that. Um, so a value stream, again, this is a safe definition, but it's still grounded in lean thinking. A value stream is the sequence of activities that contains all the people, systems, information, and materials needed to deliver value to a customer. So there's some trigger at the beginning. This could be a need, a request, a desire, um, through some market sensing, we could um, identify an opportunity or a need, or this could be a direct request from a stakeholder, a customer, internal customer or external customer. There's some request. It doesn't need to be for a feature. It could be for an idea. It could be for a big solution. It could be for an experiment, but there's some need that needs to, or idea that needs to go from concept to cash. We need to turn that idea into a finished product or a minimum viable product, something of value that we can put in front of our customers to get feedback and to realize that value. And then in between, we have the process. How do we get there? How do we define what that thing should look like? How do we build it? How do we validate it? How do we release it? So this is a very simple view of what we call in SAFE a development value stream, uh, but all value streams have, this, have these fundamental characteristics. We're just trying to get from point A to point Z um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Now this may look like a process, but value streams are different and processes. So the key difference is that both contain steps to get you from here to there. A value stream contains not only the steps, but the people, the systems, the information, and all of the materials, everything, everything that's required to get you from start to finish. Okay, so that's how value is created and that's how it reaches customers. So the goal is always to make value flow without interruptions. The better we can do that, the faster we can deliver value to our customers. All right, so that's what flow is. That's what value streams are. What blocks flow? What gets in the way of flowing without interruptions? So what we've realized is that all value streams, all flow-based systems have eight fundamental properties of flow. And there are these things. All value streams contain work in process, some level of work in process. If there was no work in process, nothing would ever get done, right? Uh, bottlenecks, there's always some bottleneck in the system. If you're a fan of uh, Eli Goldratt or, uh, or Lean Thinking, Womack and Jones, uh, or Principles of Product Development Flow from Reinertsen, if you follow the materials, if you're steeped in Lean Thinking, even if you're uh, even if you're just sort of a general practitioner, you'll realize that there's always some bottleneck in the system. This is where theory of constraints comes from and our ideas for always uh, relentlessly optimizing flow in the value stream. So there's always a bottleneck somewhere, but we also have people, workers, handoffs, cues, policies, feedback loops. All of these things are always resident in every value stream all the time. So these are universal properties of flow-based systems uh, which means that these things can either help us from a flow perspective or they can hurt us from a, from a flow perspective. If these, proper, if these properties are calibrated properly, if they're optimized well, then we have fast flow through the system. But if they're broken, if they're not optimized, then they can cause problems. So uh, if our job to be done, and as agilists, as lean thinkers, as 
uh, practitioners and transformation artists and transformation architects and leaders and practitioners uh, who are in this game of transforming enterprises and changing the way of working for better results for our customers and our businesses, we have to be thinking about these things. So all of us collectively, our job to be done here on behalf of our customers and our enterprises is to find those flow defects and debug them out of the system so that we can achieve this fast flow. So this is where we start looking for defects. We look at these fundamental properties. We look at what's working and not working. So just when we thought we had this all figured out, as lean, agile leaders and thinkers and practitioners and experts, as DevOps practitioners, product experts, whatever your job is, uh, you, and if you've been doing agile and if you've been in this game for a while, you know a lot about what it takes to find flow bottlenecks and remediate them, right? So we all knew how to do this. There were playbooks for this. And we've been doing this for years and years and years. It kind of started with the Agile manif Manifesto. So we've been refining these concepts for decades. So just when we thought we knew how to do this very well, better than anybody else, along comes ChatGPT and generative AI and kind of turns the world on its head and turned out the lights. So we were to, that event catapulted us all into a new technology era where now it seems like the rules changed overnight, right? How do we do these things? Um, but it kind of feels, at least it did to me, like in the very beginning, um, it felt like I was back in the dark with the lights shut off. I was kind of feeling around in the dark, looking for new techniques, trying to understand the situation because everything to, seemed to have changed overnight. Um, expectations changed, technology changed. Now AI was the hype and now new skill sets were coming to the fore. Uh, new requests for new types of products, the competitive landscape changed, budgets shifted, priorities shifted. So it seemed like everything was upside down and we needed to figure out again, how to accelerate value flow because the need for accelerating value flow and delivering value to our customers and enterprises didn't change. The, the game changed around it. So I kind of felt in the dark did anybody else feel like they were in the dark a little bit when all of this happened, like, you know, shaken up and upside down and didn't really know which way was up um, and we're looking for answers, right? So then along come some very respected leaders in the space, like Dr. An Andrew Ng. He's one of the world's foremost experts on AI. Uh, you might have heard him speak, you might have um, seen some quotes from him, but um, certainly he's not the only one. But I really like this quote from, from Dr. Andrew, AI is the new electricity. So for me, this quote and his insights, along with the insights of many other, uh, many other folks who are at the, at the forefront of the AI movement, really turn the lights back on. So if we think about AI as the new electricity, that seems to open up a whole new new universe of possibilities. Suddenly, uh, I don't feel in the dark anymore. I feel like um, now there's a world of endless possibilities at our fingertips and we are in the dawn of a new era, but like the discovery of electricity or the advent of the internet, things are a little bit scary, but they're a lot exciting. And now I think about the possibilities. How can I leverage this personally? How can my customers leverage this? Um, how can I learn fast and how can we harness the, the power of this technology and the people around it to do bigger and better things for our customers and our businesses? So for me, this means that no, no one really knows where AI is going to lead. We all have their, their visions uh, on, you know, at the extremes, right? No one really knows where AI will lead, but there are visions for the future, but we have a chance to shape it along the way. And that's what really excites me um, as, a, as an engineer, as a, as a human, as an innovator, as a maker, as somebody who likes to dig in and be creative and, uh, and solve big problems on behalf of my customers and my, and my businesses. So this is what I'd like us to kind of start with as a mindset. The art of the possibility here, how can we leverage AI um, and the other tools that are in our disposal 
at our disposal in the age of AI and digital to do bigger and better things, greater things for our customers. Okay. So with that, let's talk more about accelerating flow in the age of AI. We got really, really good at accelerating flow in the other era, right? And we were kind of at the top of the game. I don't know uh, how many of you have been around for a while, but it, it's, it, it feels like we, we almost perfected the art and science of flow and agility. And then AI came along. So the game has changed a little bit. Let's talk about uh, how to accelerate flow, how to harness these capabilities in ways that have never been possible before. I think that's where the real excitement is. Okay, so for, for us at Scaled Agile, this may be true of you. There's probably some intersection here with how you're thinking and how your, uh, how your companies are thinking with respect to your, your jobs, your customer bases, your clients, your partners, however you're doing business. Um, but they may be a little bit different. But for us, we're focusing on three areas of guidance for AI in the enterprise. The first one is an augmented workforce. And for us, this means people using essentially generative AI to be more productive, but not just more productive, but more happier, more happier, happier and engaged, um, loving coming to work every day and uh, being creative with the technology, learning new things and growing their skill sets and, and uh, growing their interests and passions. So the augmented workforce is a big accelerator in our minds. Another big factor, another big concentration area is AI enabled solutions. So this goes beyond the people more into the technology, the solutions and the services that we, that we produce through those value streams. So AI enabled solutions to us are products, services, and tools that deliver new forms of value. Um, you might think of your existing products and services and what they would look like with AI built in. This could mean entirely new solutions that have never been conceived before, or maybe they've been conceived, but they've never been possible before the advent of uh, real usable um, economical AI. These are AI enabled solutions. And then the third one is responsible AI. This is top of mind at, uh, you know, in most C-suites, executives are thinking about this, compliance people are thinking about this, our attorneys are thinking about this, our watchdog organizations are thinking about this, our civil rights organizations are thinking about this. How are we going to use AI responsibly? This is a big, big deal. So we have to put a lens on it and focus on it. So for us, these are the big factors in play right now. So if we're going to focus on AI in the enterprise and really get good at accelerating flow, we need to do that against the backdrop of an AI augmented workforce, AI enabled solutions and responsible AI. Of course, there are other things to consider, but for us, this is the tip of the spear. So what I wanted to do was walk through each of these one by one and kind of explain our, our position on it, what the problem is, what we see the solution is, and then introduce some ideas we have for leveraging AI and leveraging the tools and knowledge and skills that we already have at our disposal to accelerate flow. So let's start with accelerating value flow with an AI augmented workforce. This is going to focus on the people in the system. Who are the people in the system? That's us, right? That's us, that's the people around us, it's everybody in the organization. So here, back to this picture of the value stream in the middle and the flow properties around it, this one really zeroes in on the worker. And here, I want, to, I want to be very clear that here in this context, the workers are not just the people who are on the teams, not just the engineers, not just the devs uh, who are building solutions, not the, just the people who are on the line. This is everybody in the system, everybody in the value stream. So think about everybody it takes to move value from concept to cash through your organization at whatever level they are, these are the workers because we're all working together in the system as a, as a lean, agile team of teams to get that job done. And we're all agilists, right? So we all know that participation at every level of the organization is fundamentally important. 
So whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're in the system, you are one of these workers. You're doing your part to create value and move value along. Okay, so those are the workers. Those, those are the people in the system. That's us. What blocks us from flowing well? It kind of all comes down to this. Toil. Has anyone heard this term in this context, software development context or site reliability engineering context? Um, a lot of this concept is coming from the, the DevOps movement or site reliability engineering movement from Google. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, maybe two or three years, I've really seen this idea of toil and reducing toil uh, as, a, as a major theme in the software development industry proliferate. So I think it's a great descriptor for what's happening to block flow at the personal level. There's all this toil. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, it's by definition, this is Merriam-Webster's definition, it's prolonged and fatiguing labor, labor. So think about the things that you do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, sprint by sprint, iteration by iteration, quarter by quarter, whatever it is, that represents toil in your life. These are tasks that are menial, manual, repetitive, reactive, endless. They're not fun, but for some reason you have to do them or you're being asked to do them. And they're really devoid of enduring value. This is the, this is the grunt work. It's the, it's the drudgery that's just part of the job, right? Um, it's not necessarily value creating. It's not adding value to the product at, at any particular step, but it's work that seems to have to be done in order to be able to clock out at the end of the day. This is what we mean by toil. So toil really gets in the way of progress, really gets in the way of flow. And over here, you'll, you'll start to see some quotes in the, in the left margins of some of these slides. This one is from Gartner. This is a realization that, um, you know, it's, it's, not only just, it's not only my opinion, it's not just the opinion of a few people, but, uh, you know, Gartner has a wide reach. They do research on all the, these kinds of things all the time. And I've got a few other Gartner quotes and other quotes from other sources uh, peppered through the deck. But there is a lot of toil out there going on, whether it's called toil or something else. But demand is exceeding capacity in most organizations right now. Expectations are high. A lot of money and a lot of expectations are being flowed into the top of the funnel of these value streams with the expectation that innovation is going to happen very quickly. We will be able to compete with AI. Um, I'd love to know how many of you in your organizations feel this kind of pressure. There's a, there's a need to do anything with AI. We just need to get into the game with AI. We need AI-enabled solutions. We need to upskill our workforce. We need to build a talent bench around AI. We need to get these people together. Maybe we're hiring, maybe we're reskilling. Um, by a show of hands or, or in the chat, how many of you are really experiencing this kind of pressure in your organizations right now to just get into the game? We have to be in AI. Um, so that's the reality. Expectations are high and demand is high, but the skills and the capacity of the organization to meet those demands is not there. So this is what we mean by toil, and this, this hits us at a very personal level, right? So how do we reduce that toil and accelerate value flow? Well, thanks to Gen AI, we have so many tools at our disposal. And here's, here's a little infographic that shows a few of them, but this isn't even in the tip, the tip of the iceberg. This just begins to scrape the surface. And I think this is, a, this is a capture that we did in December of last year. But of course, this changes daily, right? If you're following any of the, the news feeds, the pundits, uh, getting any of the newsletters, following, following the AI news, this list changes every day. And it seems like there's just a mass proliferation, a Cambrian explosion of AI uh, companies and tools and teams right now. So new capabilities, new tools are coming to light every single day. Um, and now, especially with the, with the opening of the GPT store, we have even more at our disposal. So there's no end to the kinds of tools that are available, available 
to us today to help us reduce that toil and be more productive and be happier in our jobs. Um, and it comes down to experimenting and picking some. So for me personally, in my job, I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of speaking. I put together a lot of presentations. I put together a lot of training material. So that's a lot of, uh, you know, brain work that needs to, that needs to find its way to paper somehow. So for me, the toil, the drudgery of that job is getting through writer's block or finding a place to start or developing an outline or developing the, developing the PowerPoint decks or developing the videos or stylizing the paper, stylizing the, stylizing the decks or the presentations. So I'm starting to use a lot of these tools in my personal workflow to reduce that amount of toil so I can focus on my creative work um, and be unblocked from the menial tasks that stop the, the creative ideas in my brain from reaching, uh, from reaching the products and services that are moving across the line. Um, interested to know in the chat, if you guys are using any of these tools, what tools you're using today and why? Hey, Mark, there is a question in the chat um, related to uh, chat GPT. About exploring GPTs, okay. Um, is there one that Scaled Agile has created or is creating and will soon be available? This is something that we're working on. So we're working on AI-enabled solutions, both internally and for, um, for external consumption. There's nothing to announce yet, but just know that we are working on it for sure. Yeah, so uh, stay tuned to the Scaled Agile channels, you know, LinkedIn and people that you know within Scaled Agile for more announcements around that. And we do have a, um, um, a European summit in Berlin coming up. So there will be announcements made there and more information made about those kinds of capabilities. But yeah, stay tuned for those kinds of announcements. We are working on them. So Claude AI, uh, LLMs can be, yeah, great. So continue to, to flow those ideas in the chat. Um, I'm curious, I'm sure that um, other folks on the call are curious about what tools other people are, are using on the calls, on the call. Okay, so that's AI augmented workforce. That just kind of scratches the surface of what we mean by an AI augmented workforce. But the, the bottom line is um, now we have a whole new world of opportunities, a whole new world of tools available to us who can help accelerate our personal value flow reduce the toil and get us back on track with the creative work that gets us up um, in the morning in the first place. That can accelerate flow greatly. Accelerating flow with AI augmented solutions. So as, as I said before, AI augmented solutions are those solutions that have AI embedded in them. So these could be Solutions that uh, that we market externally to our customers, um, internal products that uh, that we deliver to internal stakeholders for use in operational value streams, uh, and they could be tooling oriented. They could be part of our infrastructure, part of our pipeline, part of our tech stacks, part of our platform engineering solutions. So all of these are examples of AI product development things that we would need to uh, build or acquire and install and make part, of, uh, make part of our solution portfolios. But what blocks that? Now we have a whole new kind of value stream that's bringing a lot of different people, a lot of different skills and a lot of different tech together, right? So whereas before it was very software development oriented it was software, software, software all day long. And remember several years ago, we started saying that software was eating the world. Software was taking over and now all, um, all products and services needed to have software embedded. Well, now AI is coming along, um, shifting that a little bit. So now AI is kind of eating the world and now we need to have some element or it feels like we need to have some element of machine learning, large language models, pattern recognition, whatever it is, some, some amount of artificial intelligence embedded into our software-based solutions. So that's bringing the AI world together, which is not new, and our software development world together, 
along with the people and the skill sets that manage each. So now we have um, data science, data, data scientists and our software engineers together in the same value stream, collaborating on creating these AI enabled solutions. Well, what are we gonna do about that? This is a new kind of value stream that requires coordination and collaboration across um, different sets of people, different mm -hmm. kinds of products, different kinds of value streams, different processes. I, I didn't like that. Uh... Coffee. Oh, the same sound, sound. I've had one. I thought though. Thank you. Okay, so now that we have, or because we have these new AI centric value streams that require software development, you can't move AI solutions without also being good at software development. Um, we have these we have these integrated value streams that now require fast flow, right? So we need to be able to contend with that. How do we do that? Well, that brings the entire value stream into focus with all eight properties. So I wanted to talk about that. How do we reconcile all eight of these flow properties with a new kind of AI value stream that integrates software and AI machine learning together? So the things that we're seeing that are getting in the way of progress and flow here are for the most part, misaligned priorities and fragmented process processes. So as, as our customers and as we see enterprises um, and teams and organizations and business units rush into the AI landscape, what we're seeing more and more is a lot of great ideas and a lot of passion for developing AI-based solutions but not a whole lot of, or not enough concentration on where the business value really is. There's a lot of experimentation going on, but here as Gartner points out, very few of these experiments are actually either uh, seeing the light of day, being productionalized, being released, and even if, even if they are being released, value is not being fully realized. So that means that something is off in the process. And what we think is off, based on, on our research and expertise, is that the value propositions are not there. There's a large focus on building AI-based solutions, but in the end, those solutions, those capabilities are not aligned with what's needed by the customers and by the business. So a lot of experimentation going on, not a whole lot of value being produced. So that's why we started to write about use cases. Um, it's important to pick the right use cases with AI. And for us, it comes down to three main use cases. Number one up here is intelligent customer solutions. So these are solutions that we market to our customers, whether internal or external, but they have AI capabilities built in. So these are more intelligent solutions. These could be the solutions that we market today with just AI and machine learning built in, or they could be entirely new solutions that leverage the capabilities of AI that we were never able to build before. So that's one particular use case. It's not the only use case. Another use case is, using AI to improve operational efficiency. These are more back office solutions. We might, um, we might build or buy artificial intelligence uh, or embedded AI augmented solutions that help uh, streamline our development pipelines or streamline our, um, streamline our, our workflows. Uh, some of the tools that I showed earlier on the slide that we talked about in Slack uh, these are things that you could do, you have the choice to either build or buy. You could you could create your own uh, large language models, your own GPTs, and use them internally, or you can subscribe to them, or you can buy them off the shelf. These are examples of productivity enhancers that are based on AI. That's use case number two. Use case number three is leveraging these AI augmented tools to increase your level of knowledge of your customers, understanding better the behavior of your customers, what are they clicking on, what are they buying, what are their interests, what delights them, what doesn't delight them, what are their buying patterns, um, what kind of journeys do they take through our, our products and services. Uh, so getting really good at understanding customer behavior in relation to our products and services is su super, super important these days. But that usually takes a lot of data grinding, data collection, data grinding, data normalization, cleansing, and getting to, um, getting to facts about what our customers really need and want and what they don't need and what they don't want. So using AI to 
increase that level of understanding is very important too. So pick the right use case and also have a way to develop those kinds of solutions. Once you have the right, once you have a use case that matches your business priorities and um, and will deliver value, then you have to have a way to move those ideas through the pipeline. And here we introduce uh, something called an AI solution path, which is a essentially development value stream for AI enabled solutions, right? Rather than the standard uh, define, build, validate, release development value stream that you may be familiar familiar with if you're if you practice SAFE. Uh, that's very good for software based solutions. We need a similar kind of value stream for AI enabled solutions. It looks a lot the same, but it's slightly different because it's a different process using different technology and different skill sets. So here, um, the labels on these steps define pilot operationalized scale and govern are slightly different than we would see in a software development, purely software development paradigm, but it's still a value stream and it's still based on uh, getting to quick results, getting to fast feedback, um, chunking big ideas down into smaller ideas and operationalizing as fast as we can and generating those wins based on validated learning and then scaling from there. That's how we can start to realign priorities, realign uh, processes and people and parts of the value stream and skill sets all be working together to deliver the right kind of value through these AI enabled solutions. Okay, now there's always a tech component to accelerating value flow from end to end through these value streams. As I said, we have a new kind of value stream facing us. It's one that combines a lot of different capabilities, software development capabilities, machine learning capabilities. So we have concepts like DevOps, DevSecOps, MLOps, model ops, other kinds of ops. You could include site reliability engineering in here and other kinds of capabilities that, um, that are either new or familiar that are designed to accelerate value flow through that pipeline all coming together. So now what does that pipeline look like? Well, in SAFE, we describe something called the continuous delivery pipeline that includes certain elements to it. And it's basically enabled by DevOps and DevSecOps and cloud-based technologies. Well, what we're saying here is don't abandon that concept, level up on that concept and create XOps capable continuous delivery pipelines. Single shared pipelines that have these XOps capabilities that bring together the experts and the processes, the tools, the materials, and the flow from the different parts of the organization that's required to build and validate and deliver these AI enabled solutions. So this is uh, just a more modern supercharged view of a continuous delivery pipeline or development pipeline, delivery pipeline, whatever terminology you use that is XOps capable. We need to be able to combine these, these skill sets and these processes together um, so that we can build AI-based solutions quickly and efficiently. Okay, now let's talk about responsible AI. We have to do all of this responsibly. So here, back to our model, the value stream and what potentially blocks flow in any flow-based system. Well, I, here I wanted to highlight this flow property policies. And we encounter this all the time as agilists and lean agile thinkers, right? Legacy policies and practices that get in the way of flow. Anybody ever experienced these? I know I have. Old waterfall policies, bureaucratic policies, um, whether they're written or whether they are committee based, there are a lot of policies and practices and governance related things that historically have stood in the way of fast value flow in the modern era. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure that you can think of a few that you've encountered in your um, uh, in your agile careers. So this is I'm talking about the same kind of thing, but now we need policies that are tuned to delivering AI-based solution and accelerating value flow in the age of AI. These could be existing policies that need to be 
that need to be modified or even remediated, or these could be these could entail the introduction of new policies that are custom tailored for this paradigm. So here we're talking about policies, and policies here are on the left side of the value stream. That's the front end of the value stream because they come into focus right away, right? During exploration, during discovery, uh, we need to be cognizant of the, the rules of the game, the policies that we need to abide by, the governance conditions, the compliance rules, the controls that we need to abide by uh, through the value stream. So it's important to establish these up front so that they carry through all the way through the uh, through the value stream. So that's what potentially blocks sustainable value. But why is this important? Why are policies so important? I mean, you could argue that in a lean agile world, we're trying to eliminate policies. We're trying to eliminate bureaucracy. We're trying to eliminate governance as much as we can. Well, we're not trying to eliminate it. We're trying to streamline it and we're trying to lighten it. Uh, we need compliance, we need assurance, and we need governance, but we need the right kind of governance in the right places at the right times to do it effectively. And with AI comes a new flavor of governance that we really, really need to pay attention to because it matters. Um, when mistakes, when errors, when hallucinations, when biases occur with AI-enabled solutions, the effects can be very dramatic, costly, damaging, like these examples. Companies are getting fined. Uh, racial biases are being introduced into models and being discovered by third parties. Uh, fleets of vehicles are being recalled. Copyright laws are being infringed upon. Confidential information is being shared. These can have big, big results at an enterprise level, much like security breaches can have big, big results. Um, and of course, we don't ignore security. We make security everybody's responsibility. This is just another set of responsibilities that we need to shift left and spread through the entire value stream. So responsible AI is now everyone's responsibility in the value stream. So we need to do it. We need to take it seriously. And we need, we need to do just the right amount of responsible AI, have just the right amount of policy and controls in place so that we can move value safely through the value stream. So sometimes we need to slow down a little bit in order to speed up. This is one of those examples. So how do we do that? In order to maintain fast, sustainable flow, because remember, if we don't do this, we could be introducing errors or biases or defects that cost the company and us a lot of money, um, reputational damage, um, time, energy, and all of that reduces the overall value proposition in, uh, that was established in the first place. So if our job is to accelerate the flow of value, we also need to make sure that that flow of value is sustainable over time. It's not enough just to get new product into production or new features into production. We need to make sure that that value is sustainable over time, which means that we need to approach AI responsibly. Okay, so here response, uh, to us, Responsible AI is a holistic approach to developing, deploying, and overseeing AI systems in a manner that is ethically sound, it's transparent, and this may be the most important aspect. It's centered on human values. It's centered on human values. So that needs to shine through our policies and practices as we're building and, and delivering and maintaining AI, as we're training the models, as we're retraining the models, as we're evaluating the value of these uh, AI-enabled solutions. So we do that um, over on the right by establishing these RAI policies. And here are some of the things that we would do to put those in place. Policies and guidelines, playbooks, metrics, independent audits, training and change management, um, and treating responsible AI as a set of non-functional requirements that we introduce early in the process non-functional requirements that constrain all the items in the backlog so that we're sure to get them into play and they're things that we actively test for in the process. So it's not enough just to have the policies in place. We need to be able to enforce the policies. And if we can, if we can get those into our features, into our stories, into our backlogs, into the system of work and be testing for them uh, 
regularly along the way, we'll stand a better chance of not only having responsible AI policies, but delivering solutions that are responsible and will have lasting sustainable value. Um, some examples of things that I'm talking about here are privacy, security, um, safety, fairness, ethics, inclusiveness, transparency, uh, sustainability, accuracy, interpretability, um, standard governance com compliance and legal, legal kinds of controls. So some of these some of these constraints are new constraints and specific to AI. Some of them overlap existing constraints, making sure that our AI solutions remain compliant with our existing controls. So the two need to come together and we need to make sure that we have practices in place and tooling in place to ensure that our, our um, AI solutions are compliant with all of these policies. Okay, need to be able to check that box. But again, we don't want this to be heavyweight. We need it to be agile, we need it to be lean. Uh, so that we can do just enough responsible AI, just enough policy creation and enforcement at just the right times um, to enable fast value flow, but with safety and security and risk mitigation built in. Okay, guys, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Here's a, a quick recap. So in order to accelerate value flow with AI in the age of AI, I'm proposing three things. Let's concentrate on an AI augmented workforce that reduces toil for us individually. Leverage the power of GPTs, experiment with them, write them yourselves, pair with other people, team on projects, run hackathons to develop these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, GPT capabilities or to leverage them and perfect them so that uh, you can bring AI on board as a team member. I'd really like you to start thinking about bringing AI on as a team member that you can pair with, that you can trust. AI is your co-pilot. AI is another expert on the team that is just another member of the Agile team. Helping to augment the work of the team and accelerating value flow. It's kind of weird to think about, right? And suddenly, now we're inviting robots onto the team. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Next, AI-enabled solutions. So think about AI enabling your solutions to accelerate value flow. So there's a new kind of value that our customers and our business are, as businesses are asking for, right? That may require us to build AI into existing solutions. It may require us to innovate our way into new solutions that didn't exist before. We need to be able to accelerate that value, which means that we need new pipelines. We need to organize around value in different ways. We need to bring different people and different skill sets together in new ways. Um, or using existing techniques that we know how to do to ensure that um, those AI-enabled solutions can go to market quickly and effectively and safely deliver value and deliver sustainable value. And that sustainable value, a lot of it comes from our ability to, uh, to apply responsible AI practices and having a mindset through the entire organization, through the entire value stream that is focused on responsible AI at all times from the data science, from the data collection, to the harvesting, to the, the model generation, the training, the retraining, the delivery, and to the monitoring, um, all through the pipeline, all through the life cycle of AI-based solutions. Um, let's stay responsible about it because if we're not, the consequences can be huge and value can be eroded very quickly. All right, so with that, um, those are my thoughts on how to accelerate value flow in the age of AI. Um, bottom line here, go experiment. Have fun. I know I am. Um, it, these times are a little bit scary, but like I said before, I think they're more exciting than scary. And the, the more I experiment with, uh, with AI, GPTs and other forms of AI, um, I'm finding that uh, the sky's the limit with the potential here. I'm finding new ways to accelerate my personal flow and I'm finding new ways to accelerate uh, my team's flow, my organization's flow and uh, my customer's flow. So Let's all together experiment and, um, and help shape the destiny of AI. It's not set. The future is not set. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, really appreciate the presentation. There are a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, we'll start with the first one. In regards to the misaligned priorities, could you use the WSJF concept? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
WSJF works because it's based on the concept of cost of delay. So we need to think about the cost of delay of, uh, of pursuing one solution or one idea over the other. So it's a great way to prioritize. It's a great way to quickly rationalize um, a set of opinions, a set of ideas, and to uh, kind of workshop and get agreement and alignment on what really represents the highest cost of delay AI-based solution or AI-oriented problem to solve right now. Absolutely. And WSJF, just for those of us not in the know, what does that stand for? Weighted shortest job first. So this is uh, this is a method that we apply to prioritizing epics, to prioritizing features um, that allows us to think about the economic impact of our ideas. So this guards against you know, the highest paid person in the room just slamming their fist down on the table and saying, we got to have this, stop the presses, I need to move this in now. It also stops uh, fly-in work, um, you know, things that just kind of come out of left field, ideas that come in from stakeholders, customers, executives, team members, influential people that disrupt the system, right? Um, in, in SAFE and in Agile and Lean, we always need to take an economic view first. So we need to think about the economic impact, the economic value of the decisions that we're making and the solutions that we're pursuing. So using weighted shortest job first allows us to narrow in on the jobs or the ideas um, or the work that has the largest benefit in the shortest amount of time. If we focus on, focus on those, then we will be able to deliver more value sooner and keep things agile and lean. Well, it makes sense. And then we had another question. How do you make incorporating AI actionable? Many companies are still working to get uh, DexecOps a reality. Um, and it looks like uh, Levetta is in traditional financing. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, could you reiterate the first part of the question? Yeah, so... Um, how do we make incorporating AI actionable? Actionable. And okay, I see it now. Many companies are still working to get DevSecOps a reality. Yes, many companies are still trying to perfect DevOps, DevSecOps, um, even Agile, even doing Agile at scale um, is not an easy task, right? So we're we're amid the transformation. Now we need to transform within the tra within the transformation, and that's more complex. Um, I think the the first thing to do is realize that that's a situation and realize that we need to get really good at these things really fast. Um, also realize that in order to succeed with AI, you need agile, you need agility as a foundation, you need um, acceleration through practices like DevOps and DevSecOps. I would include site reliability, engineering, those kinds of concepts in place already. Those are foundational. If you're not yet up to speed on those capabilities, you need to get them really fast because the longer um, the longer it takes you for for you to develop those capabilities in your organization, the longer it's going to take you to develop proficiency with AI based solutions. So, uh, you know, the I guess the crux of the question was, how do we make incorporating AI actionable? You got to do it. Just go do it. Find ways to do it. Experiment. Um, I have a, I have a sticky note up on my wall right behind my desk that reminds me to experiment with, with AI daily. So if we do things like that, we um, we need to put AI at the forefront. Um, it doesn't need to be a big thing. It doesn't need to be big solutions. They don't need to be big funded initiatives. Just little things build up and build up, and then we share those experiences with others, and that's how we learn, and that's how the concepts kind of go viral and that's how we reinforce each other's learning. And that's then how the, the good ideas and the good practices spread through the enterprise quickly. So I'd say, hey, just do it, dive in wherever it makes sense for you to dive in, have fun with it, but also make it productive, learn constantly, um, and then apply those learnings to your own personal workflows and then share them with others and look for the patterns that are working at the team level, then look at the patterns that are working at the organizational level, experiment, 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 but build in validated learning so that you can pivot when you need to. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. That takes us to the top of the hour. We did have three more questions. So do you have a few more minutes to stick around? Absolutely. I can stay on. Yep. 
Okay, excellent. We'll we'll go through these three more questions and then call it a SIG. If you need to drop off, of course, uh, feel free to. And Mark's contact information is there. So uh, let's start with Beth's question. Who are the experts rating AI tools? An AI trained by one set of opinion, opinions, ideas, culture may vary wildly over another. How do we know which one to start with? Exactly. <laughs> right. We don't really. You can check the sources. Um, it, it's up to us. I think it's the Wild West right now. We don't really know. Everybody has an opinion. Everyone's trying to figure this out. Um, there are a lot of really, really interesting, uh, you know, really powerful tools coming out of the market. And, you know, almost, you know, I'd say faster than anybody can really rate them effectively. So I would take all of the ratings with a grain of salt. If you're, um, you know, something that I do and some of my colleagues do is we uh, we follow certain influencers in the AI space, you know, like Dr. David Eng and some others. And we follow them. We, we look to the people that we've trusted for a while and now what they're saying about AI as a starting point. We follow their progress, their announcements, their, their speaking schedules, um, their their social media posts and uh, then start to follow who they're following. So leverage your trusted sources, the trusted sources that you have now, um, discover what they're saying about AI and then that, that will lead to other trusted sources. Yeah, thanks Mark. So Good day we from a... you, Beth. <laughs> Uh, we had a question from JD. There's a significant proliferation of AI tools. Many are just veneers over larger sources like chat GPT or don't offer much differentiation. Do you think that there will be a change in business models with AI? Consumers will use AI services in a metered format like electricity rather than as licensed products. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No question. Um, it's the it, a lot like we saw during the the early days of the internet, right? Everybody rushed in, everyone was creating websites and applets and, you know, a little dancing baloney on the screen. Um, all kinds of weird, creative, esoteric, fun, business-oriented things. Everyone was getting into the game and putting the ideas out there. So I think we're, we're, exper we're experiencing the same kind of Cambrian explosion, but just like you know, the, the natural business cycle of things, the cream is going to rise to the top. There will be consolidation and the, uh, the good tools will be separated from the not so good tools or the more popular tools will be separated from the less popular tools. And we'll start to see uh, more of a conglomeration of the, um, of, the, of the disparate tools into focused product categories which will make it easier for us to select, to select, especially at an enterprise level, right? Um, at an enterprise level, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a CTO or if I'm a CIO or I'm a member of the C-suite or if I'm in charge of, in charge of um, bringing in AI capabilities into my firm, I really wouldn't know who to trust right now because there, there aren't stable categories with, uh, with vendors with a long track record of success. So I'd be tempted to wait a little while for the market to consolidate and for uh, the vendors to start to establish track records. I think, you know, right now it's just everybody experimenting and us trying to follow along, unless you're an experimenter too. Okay. Very cool. So, um, and we have one more question. So, uh, and then I think we can call it a wrap and let me get back to it. It came from uh, Igor. How can we use AI for the business agility transformation for a non-IT project and to which circumstances could it be used? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a great thing about great thing about AI. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't discriminate. It's there for workflow purposes. So a lot of these, especially the generative AI tools, exists to reduce toil across a broad landscape of roles and skills. It's not just software development. Um, is anybody familiar with the DevX movement, developer experience? 
So this is something that we follow very closely at Scale and Agile as part of this software development movement, right? Um, it's a big deal now in every part of the organization to improve the developer experience because the developer experience is directly tied to employee satisfaction, employee engagement, employee motivation, and that has a direct impact on economic results in the firm. So now it's a big deal to improve developer experience. So within the software community, there's a lot of talk about how to increase the developer experience, how to reduce toil. That's where the, the idea of toil came from and has been popularized. But I guess, thank you for, for raising this question. And what I want to emphasize to everybody here is it's not just about the developers. It's about everybody's experience. It's about the worker experience. It's about the, the personal experience, the human experience, Humex across the entire organization. So um, the great thing is that there are, there are tools for everybody in every workflow everywhere. So find those tools that help you in your workflow. I'm not a software developer. I support software development organizations and technology organizations that are trying to put together these kinds of complex solutions. But I myself, I'm not a developer, but my experience has been very much enhanced by tools that allow me to create faster, write faster, put together presentations faster, email faster, um, all sorts of things that I do as part of my daily workflow that is not software development oriented. Well, excellent. Exactly. Yes, thank you so much for your time, Mark. Really appreciate it. Uh, got a lot of kudos in the chat. I'll just echo two comments, uh, which um, Hannah said that the this was a great talk and discussion. It'd be cool to have this discussion again in a year and see how things have changed. So I hope you'll be updating the presentation and maybe we can have you back again. And then Andrea Pratt Smith said, Mark is the new Fabio and totally agree. And we will <laughs> right. be at some point saying, you can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> right. I don't know if I'm the new Fabio or if this guy is the new Fabio. I think this guy is a new, like a Marlboro Fabio man. Um, <laughs> Texas style Fabio. That's what I, <laughs> I aspire to be this guy. <laughs> exactly. So, well, thanks again for your time as well as for staying over. Thanks for the folks that stayed over, asked questions, really good stuff. The recording will be up on YouTube. Um, and Mark, I'll uh, shoot you a note for the uh, presentation if you want to get that over to us so we can post that to the meetup page. You'll get a notification about that by early next week at the latest. So thanks again, everyone, for your time. And thanks to Mark. And yeah, we'll see you soon next month. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a great Take weekend. care. Okay. Bye-bye.